When I came to Germany in 2015 and I saw all this reporting about the Syrian refugee cases, it's like, oh, everybody is running from Assad. And I was like so naive. And I thought like, no, I have to speak up and I have to tell them that not everyone is running from Assad. There is a war happening there. We have ISIS, we have Nusra, we have tens of different terrorist groups and those are supported by CIA. So what I did, because I'm, I'm, I'm traditionally left-wing person, I grew up in a left-wing family, but not an American left because American left is completely different thing, you know, and <laughs> traditional left, let's say. And uh, I came and the first political party I tried to open to was the Linke party. The Linke party means the left party. And I told them I want to give a presentation, a lecture about the Syrian war, and then they accepted it. And in a week, they canceled the, uh, the event because they said my opinions are too controversial and my opinion on Israel embarrasses them, this and that, and they don't want this controversy in their party, so they canceled it. The only party that accepted my uh, uh, request to give a lecture and explain to them what happened in, in Germany is the AFD. AFD is the alternative for Germany. It's a right-wing populist party. In the German uh, establishment press, they call it a far-right, a neo-Nazi, this and that. But in my, in my uh, like when I socialize with them, these people are not neo-Nazis. In my, I mean, <laughs> I, I can know when someone is a neo-Nazi or not, right? Mm -hmm. from, from, from the way they speak, what they believe in, there were so many intellectual people in this conference. And because I said all these things that I said now to you during this uh, lecture about the Syrian war, and this was recorded, the German press picked this, uh, my conference and what I said, and they waged the most brutal media campaign against me that I was uh, so terrified that my face was on TV. Uh, uh, for a few days. My face was in newspapers. They called me all sorts of names. They said that I'm a radical right-wing person. I'm spreading hate against the refugees. And I am uh, the right hand of Assad in Germany, this and that. They created stories out of nothing. And I'm, uh, I'm not a rich person. I don't have lawyers. But despite mm -hmm. that, I hired three lawyers and I spent all my money on lawyers to defend myself. They drained me economically and they took this issue to the court. They uh, raised uh, court cases against me saying that I uh, am a spy for Assad. So the secret police started following me, in, uh, calling my friends, interrogating them, asking them questions if they think that I'm a spy. So they watched me until I went to the court and the, uh, the judge asked me if I'm a spy. And if I am, because the uh, official narrative that, that the press, they uh, told to the court is that I am taking photos of the Syrian refugees here and I send it, I, I'm going to send it to Syria so that the Assad regime uh, comes after their families and sends, sends them to jail. This is a very crazy and absurd, absurd story that imagine someone like me, I have a YouTube channel, I have a remarkable beard. It's not like someone who is, can hide himself in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, my face is very uh, like millions of people know my work, you know, like how can I be myself the spy? Like this is so ridiculous that, but the, the people believed it here until I went to the court, the court wanted to deport me to Syria. So for them, I was the danger. I posed the danger. So I realized that uh, my naivety in 2015 and 16, thinking that maybe the politicians do not know so that uh, they misled, misguided, I have to educate them. That's completely bullock. I, I mean, now I believe that they have bad intentions. They know what's mm -hmm. happening in Syria and they know what happened to the Nord Stream and they know that their people are suffering from the economic burden of this world. They know everything, but they don't care because they're completely detached from the street. They are living in their very cushy lifestyles. They don't socialize with these problems. They don't encounter these problems. They don't live it on a daily basis. Their salaries are very high. So why would they care? Now, this is the, this is the situation in Germany that the people are, the increasing number of people are voting for what they call the radical right or the radical mm -hmm. left. Now, because any opposition party is it's either radical right or radical left or undemocratic parties. This is a new talking point for you to know. We have now undemocratic parties in Germany and the people are voting for parties who pose that pose a danger to the, the German democracy. Because last week we had uh, regional elections in Thuringia and Saxony and 50% of the people voted for the opposition parties. So the establishment is very terrified about that. Um, geez, it's, it's such a mess. It's such a total, you know, and it's, 
here we are. Uh, oh, well, let's go back to Assad for a second there. What was it when the Arabs, so let's, before we get to what the West had against Assad, what did you have against Assad? So you were saying that the Arab Spring, you thought, oh, this would be a good, a good thing. We might get democracy. What was it that you were unhappy with? I mean, in 2011, I had a completely different conviction. I thought that in Europe and in the United States, we have free press and free speech and freedoms and this and that. Now that I live in Germany and I can see what's happening in social media platforms, uh, the suppression of the voices, the algorithms and uh, deplatforming people and not giving them opportunities to become just journalists like you, yourself, for example, you, you had lots of troubles for having, uh, yeah. to have, a, for being a vocal, right? So, right. We don't have a freedom of speech. There is always limitations here. And these limitations and the tolerance for criticism is get, becoming too low nowadays for uh, ordinary uh, journalists or an independent journalist to have a strong opinion about major, major issues like Corona, like lockdowns, like the centralized digital currencies, like the refugee crisis. It's dangerous right. to have an opinion. So, but back then in 2011, I thought, there are freedoms in Europe and in the United States. And I wanted for us to have similar freedoms in Syria because the government controls the press, uh, controls the political life. And we have nine different political parties, but everyone is under the control of the main Al-Ba'as socialist uh, pan-Arabist party. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm not an Arabist. I'm not a pan-Arabist. And I wanted to be part of the political life in Syria. But now that mm -hmm. I live in Europe and I see how the press is heavily is heavily embedded with the establishment. They are under direct direct influence of the establishment. They're scripted news. And you're not allowed to say your mind about what's happening in Gaza. It, right. You could be fined. You could end up in jail in Germany. So it's not, we don't have a freedom of speech. If, if, if people are not allowed to question the uh, German government's support for Ukraine, or German government support for Israel, okay. why would I send my taxpayer money to Ukraine or Israel? They have to give us a choice, right. for example. But saying it is very dangerous in Germany. And sure. I know people personally that their houses have been uh, invaded by the secret police, their electronics have been confiscated, and they just suck all their data and they ask you to wait for a few months until yeah. they analyze all the data. You're not allowed to leave the country to do this and that. This is not an environment that any uh, independent mind minded person wants to live in, you know, and this is right. all normalized nowadays in Western Europe, in the UK, in the United States. And, you know, many examples. Yeah, COVID, it definitely, we saw a lot of this during COVID, people that were just speaking up against lockdowns in Germany. I know several people that were raided by the secret police that would show up. And uh, yeah, it was just really dystopian stuff. Why do you think, so what is it about Assad the West didn't like? What? Why would they back oh. <laughs> all of these terrorist groups to destabilize and go after Assad rather than the secular Assad that was allowing people to be any religion they were? I mean, the U.S. could say for democracy, you know, oh, well, we like, oh, Kabork wants democracy. So we're going in there to help spread democracy. But they don't care when it comes to Jordan. They don't care when it comes to Saudi Arabia. They don't care when it comes to all of these other countries in the area that still have monarchies or what, you know, they're, they're not really, wh why aren't we toppling Saudi Arabia if that's the, if that's actually the logic, right? But we're not. Yes. So what is it about Assad that the West didn't like? First of all, when Assad came to power, um, the United States, European countries, they all wanted to have good relationship with him. They called him a reformer. They tried to persuade him to sign an uh, association trade deal with the European Union. They wanted to have him on their side. So they were having good relationship with him. And there was a, a time when the CIA and the Syrian government have co cooperated against terrorism. CIA sent many of the Al-Qaeda militants who they captured in the Middle East to Syria for them to stay in, in the Syrian in jail so the relationship was not as bad as people think the the, the relationship started to deteriorate in 2003 because in 2003 when the uh, u.s occupied iraq and invaded it illegally uh, uh colin powell back then he came to uh to syria and he brought with him a list of demands to Assad, and he said, "If you want, if you want to stay in power, and you do, if you don't want to um, like uh, have a similar fate like Saddam Hussein, you have to follow our dictates. Now we are the hegemons here." And the 
the all the demands were one the syria has to stop its strategic relationship with iran syria has to stop supporting uh, hezbollah and hamas and close their offices mm -hmm. in syria syria should not support the iraqi resistance against the american forces there and has to uh, um, uh, minimize its relationship with russia because there was a mm -hmm. strategic relationship and the russians had an access to the mediterranean thanks to syria and assad said no I mean, we're a sovereign country and uh, I stand um, um, on these positions and uh, my people want these policies and I will follow them. And since then, they started destabilizing Syria. They started supporting what is called opposition, creating radio channels in the country, NGOs, uh, sending aid and money to the NED, the USAID, the Soros organizations, trying to persuade the people to rise against Assad. But this was a big failure. They, nobody uh, just carried arms or waged a war against Assad up until 2011. And this was mainly because the Israelis have uh, been fed up with Assad. Um, for Assad, Israel, uh, they don't in, in Syria, they don't recognize the legitimacy of Israel as a political entity. Uh, they believe in a one state. I mean, they negotiated previously with Israel, but they don't recognize Israel. In my opinion, in Syria, they believe in a one state solution where the Jews and the Palestinians and the Christians and everyone live side by side in a one state secular democratic country. But they don't believe in an Israeli country that has uh, discriminatory laws against the rest you know so mm -hmm. they supported the armed groups fighting against israel i mean a huge amount of weapons that it, nowadays hezbollah uses against uh, israel came from syria and similarly many of these weapons have been smuggled by hezbollah to the gaza strip so the israelis mm -hmm. know these things so they wanted to kick him out to oust him and install a puppet government uh, someone who would normalize relations with uh, Israel, just like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, a peace agreement, and uh, uh, pursues an anti, let's say, Iranian policy, anti Hezbollah, anti Hamas policy in the region. So, this was the main reason, in my opinion, why they wanted to oust Assad, not for democratic reasons, not for uh, freedom, uh, human rights, etc., but because Assad and his father, they supported the uh, in Syria what they call the resistance against the Israeli occupation forces, because we have also occupied territories by Israel, and they believe that Israel will not return these territories unless it is forced to return these territories. And the experiences now prove, after 80 years of occupation of Palestine, that Israel has not withdrawn one inch from the territories they occupied unless they were forced right. to withdraw from these territories. So I'm just so uh, this is the reason this why they want policy. Well, and this is just like yeah. a, you know, this is this has been the foreign policy since uh, before the Cold War, right? During the Cold War and basically since World War II, which has been do everything you can to isolate the people you don't like, the countries you don't like, do everything you can to, to and that sounds like what's gone on here. It's that Syria was still friendly with Iran and the West was saying, you're not allowed to be friendly with Iran. And that's kind of why we ended up in all of these other wars, like Vietnam War. It was, well, you're not allowed to be friendly with the Soviets, right? It was, it's, it's this, yeah. all of these proxy wars that we're fighting, it's the proxy wars. And the, the proxies so far have been mostly the Soviets, now Russia. Uh, also, we're seeing a lot of Iran. We've seen that definitely ramp up over the last couple of over the, the last few decades and now we're starting to see that same rhetoric with china right where we have to start and it's just kind of like brace ourselves for the new proxy wars that are going to be fought against china because we've been doing this against the soviets and against iran and it's exhausting this is it's not a working strategy it destabilizes it ultimately ends up with i i mean it it, it hasn't ever worked so i don't know why we're continuing down this path. And now you've got Europe with millions of refugees flooding into the country, into the various countries in Europe uh, from the various different proxy wars, from Ukraine, from Syria, right? From all of these different, from these different proxy wars. And that's why we're getting a flood of immigrants here in the United States as well as from our Southern border. It's a lot of the destabilizing efforts that the US has done throughout Latin America. Um, and but you know, you Kim, know, what's just... the problem? The problem is the problem is with the influx of all these refugees. There is a serious problem here. The people who oppose now the refugees and they don't want any refugee, any migrant. I mean, 
they have to also oppose the wars of the US. I don't understand yeah. when the war happens, they're silent on it. And then when right. the refugees arrive, they become vocal about it. And right. this they're is the crazy the part dots. of this. Yeah. No, no. I mean, where are the refugees are coming from? Iraq, what happened in Iraq? Afghanistan, what happened in Afghanistan? Where right. were the training uh, camps for the, the Al-Qaeda terrorists in the 70s and the 80s? Pakistan, what happened to Syria? What happened to uh, the Libya, for example? Gaddafi uh, warned Europe, he said, what are you doing? If you remove me from power, do you know what's going to happen? There is going to be waves and waves and waves of refugees coming from the uh, African continent to you. Do you want that? And they killed him. They killed him in the worst way possible. And back then, there was very little opposition, uh, as far as I remember, to this war. Because right. they sold this war as a war for democracy and human rights, just like against Assad. And they are just recycling the same lies. Assad's forces and Qaddafi forces and Saddam's forces have been vaping the women. And they have gassed their own people and this and that. And they're just killing. In, they just wake up in the morning and they decide to kill innocent people. You know, this is just crazy because they portray these leaders as insane, mad Hitler of the 21st century. And they sell it like that and the people buy it. But then when the refugees arrive, oh, we don't want refugees. I mean, sorry, my entire life has been destroyed in Syria. They bombed our shops. My, my brother has been kidnapped and then liberated. Our car has gone. Nothing left for us to live there. I mean, what do you expect from someone to do in such, a, uh, in such an environment? Now, Syrians who are coming from Syria again as refugees, there is no active war there. So what? why are they coming? Because the US imposes draconian sanctions on the Syrian people. Syrians are not allowed to have bank accounts. Syrians cannot have a PayPal. Syrians cannot have an X account from Syria. Syrians cannot make any transactions outside the world, even for medicine and even for food. You cannot make transactions because you're out of SWIFT. So in these circumstances, you are a young Syrian a man or a woman studied, finished your education, and you want to start working or benefit from the internet and do some personal work, and you cannot do that. You want to post a video and educate people about something on YouTube, you cannot do that. So what can these people do nowadays there? And I say it with a heavy heart because I know I have friends, I have family members in Syria, and these people are desperate and they want to come to Europe and they want to go to the United States. Why not for them? Because in their perspective, the the, uh, the financial wealth is there. The opportunities are there because they don't have any opportunities any longer. Have you heard any? Uh, uh, have you heard the Syrian refugee before 2011? Kim it was is there was there any Syrian refugee before 2011? Why it has happened? People have to wake up and see that this endless wars, this war machine in Washington D.C. has to be stopped, and that's why the people are craving for a multipolar world. Not because they love Russia, not because they love China but because they want to see some balance in the international system where other countries saying no to the U.S. empire because the U.S. has over 750, uh, polit let's say, military posts around the world, including in my country, Syria, illegally. What are they doing in Syria? Stealing our oil. We, we cannot even extract our own oil, sell it, and use it for reconstruction. They just guarding them, quote unquote. So they don't let us have our oil fields. And at the same time, they're blocking our trade routes with Iraq and Jordan. So they're strangling the people. So what can the people do? You know, it's difficult. The, the government only prints money and this only creates more inflation. Just for the context, one Syrian lira, one dollar before the war was 50 Syrian lira. So every 15 Syrian lira was one dollar. It's now fifteen thousand. Wow! So it's, like wow. The, it's it's a hyperinflation. <laughs> people, how can the people live in in such circumstances when the salaries yeah. are still the same? Yeah, yeah. I I wish people would connect those dots and realize that it's the destabilization through wars, through sanctions, through a, var a variety of mechanisms that ultimately lead to the refugees. I think Europe is going to have to be the first to say no to the United States. I think it's going to have to be Europe saying we've we've already taken the brunt of this over and over and over again. The U.S. we're so isolated over here. We've got two oceans and Canada, and you know we've got a southern border. But other than that, the United States is not feeling the pain of all of these. Yes. You know we're not getting waves of Muslim you know uh, refugees coming in to this country. There's of course there's people that talk about it and they scream mm -hmm. about it, but it's just not happening here. 
So, you know, we're getting, we're, all of ours are coming from Latin America for the most part, India and China. They're not coming from the Middle East. But Europe is taking all of the Ukrainians. Europe is taking all of the, like you said, the Iraqis, the Afghanis, the Syrians. The, they're taking all of the refugees from these countries where we have created um, war and terrible living conditions. Hey guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to kimiversonshow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to kimiversonshow.com. Thank you so much for watching.